Good afternoon, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to you wherever you might be in the world, and a very special warm welcome to our three schools this morning, Tallwood Elementary, Southside Elementary, and Newland Elementary. Welcome to Safari Live. My name is Steve Falkenbridge, and I'm joined on camera by the very talented Senzo Ngize. And please feel free to send through your questions and comments via your teacher. Let her know what you'd like to see and what any questions you might have. Boys and girls, we are very fortunate today. This morning, our friends were out and they found a leopard. Have a look at that. We have got a young male leopard. His name is Tamba. He's just parking out underneath this tree in the shade. And he actually killed a large female kudu sometime this morning or late last night. We are not very sure, but we have got other teams out that will be joining us shortly on Bushwalk will be Taylor and then on Drive will be, oh, sorry, Bushwalk will be Scott and on Drive will be Taylor. So they'll be out shortly to join us. And uh, this is live, boys and girls, and very interactive. And your questions and comments are very important to our show. Alison would like to know what leopards eat, and they eat meat, and only meat, primarily. Um, sometimes they might feed on some insects in dire conditions, but they feed primarily on meat in the form of small antelope, uh, such as kudu, impala, dakers, steenbok, and all sorts of things like that. They will feed on carrion as well, so they will steal the meat from other animals, for example, one of the other males that we have here, we saw with a young buffalo at one stage, which is quite bizarre because buffalo are very, very big animals. But isn't he beautiful? He's just relaxing in the shade. He's panting. We are going to stay here with this leopard for quite some time, so please send your questions through about leopards, see if we can answer them. And while we do so, we're going to go over to my good friend, Taylor McCurdy, who would also like to say good afternoon. We have managed to find, boys and girls, the leopard killed a very large female kudu. And what you are seeing there, and this is not for sensitive viewers, I'm afraid, there are lots and lots and lots of flies busy feeding on the female herself. That is her head. In fact, and the, the, the flies themselves will lay eggs in the meat and they will actually eat quite a huge proportion of that meat before the leopard is able to finish it. Sorry about the pole. We do have a roof on in case of some rain. AJ would like to know how old Tumba is and he's probably close to two years at the moment, nearly two. I'm not sure exactly the date, but he's a little bit younger than another boy with that we have nearby, Hosanna, who turned two last month. And there he is. Isn't he beautiful? If you compare the size of him and this kudu, it is phenomenal. The size difference, how he managed to, to take that down, is very, very good. It's a really big kudu female. There's lots and lots of meat for him to feed on. But the problem is, is it's too big an animal for him to take up the tree. And if he can't take it up the tree, we are going to see hyena and possibly even lion coming this evening to steal it from him. So we're going to go back up to Taylor, who's got something that's normally part of the leopard's diet, not kudu, something a bit smaller. Thank you, Scotty. Be safe out there on foot, my friend. It is a jungle out there. Here we are with Tumba again. He is enjoying the shade. It's not a very hot afternoon. It's only 84 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. And he has eaten a little bit of meat, but he is not full by all means. We have another vehicle in the sighting. They are from the land, one of the landowners from north of us. So if you hear a vehicle, that would be him. Quite a few vehicles do come in and out of these areas on safari. William would like to know how long leopards live for. In the wild, male leopards probably live for about 10 to 12 years, maybe 13, whereas females can live up to 15, 16 years of age. Uh, that is with all natural things happening, but there is lots of competition out here. Uh, leopards are, run the risk always of getting into trouble with lions, hyena, and other leopards. 
but they are very, very strong and adaptable animals. So those years, I said, are generally what happens, but sometimes they get caught by lions or hyena, and if they are, get injured in any way, it makes life very difficult. There's a question there about, do any other animals eat leopards? Well, I have seen Malachi, hello Malachi, I have not seen lep anything eating leopards, but I have heard that hyenas will eat a dead leopard. Um, some, li some leopards will eat other leopard cubs. They will kill them. It's a very sad story, but it is part of what happens. And also I've seen a documentary on when a, a really big snake, a, a python, killed a baby leopard, and then the mother killed the snake, took the baby out of its belly, and then ate the baby. So, very sad story, but um, not many animals do eat leopards, but it does happen from time to time. So, we are with this leopard, and I thought I might show you a, a little picture of what the kudu looks like once uh, we get a good view of him in his spots. Just come back to the dashboard here, and you can see the kudu. Here at the bottom, we've got the female kudus. Aren't they beautiful? That's what they look like when they're alive. Quite large. They stand about 1.5 meters. And they can get up to about 400, almost 500 pounds, which is a very, very big animal. This female here probably weighs about 300 pounds and the leopard only weighs about 160. So you can imagine the battle that would have ensued with this male trying to kill this female. And there's a lot of meat for him. You see the male on the right with the big horns and the female without the horns. So Nick, the reason why he's breathing so hard is because he is r relatively hot because of the sun, and, and also the breathing helps in digestion. He's sort of, his metabolism is speeding up. He's got a belly full of protein, full, full, full of protein, and so he's panting and absorbing and using lots of water to try and break down the full belly of meat that he has there. It's quite common in cats to pant like that. Also helps with him cooling down. <laughs> Zia, would you like to know if leopards swim? It's not very common for them to swim. They don't like water, as most cats don't like water. Leopards I've seen before walking along a road, and the road uh, had a small uh, river stream that crossed over it after a lot of rain. And I watched this leopard look at the water and, and hiss and spit and growl at the water. And it wasn't very keen to jump over or to get its feet wet. So they don't really enjoy the water. Um, but so not swimmers at all but there are stories of leopards getting in the water but I haven't seen an adult I once was very fortunate to see a cub playing near a little pond with its mother and it got very excited and ended up jumping and falling into the pond and then had the fright of its life as it tried to claw its way out to the other side it didn't look very happy it lost about half of its size because it was drenched with water and then shook itself off and looked very sad while its mother didn't seem to pay too much attention. You can see he's swatting at his face. All these flies are quite annoying for him. Thank you very much, Scotty. And we are still with Tumba, the beautiful leopard male, who's, as I said, about two years of age. And he hasn't done too much since we've been here, apart from just swat a few flies. But that is what cats like this do. They spend a lot of their time sleeping. Isn't that a wonderful idea? They don't have to go to school. They don't have to do any homework. <laughs> Stephanie would like to know when animals sleep. Do they sleep in the morning or at night? Well, essentially leopards will sleep whenever they want to. The only thing that makes them move is when they get hungry or when they get thirsty. Um, and if possibly a lion comes along, they might move. But if not, they just lie down and relax. If they've managed to secure some food and they're not too far from water, they won't do too much 
for a very long time, but uh, we are definitely going to see some activity around this this evening. The smell is very, very strong. That kudu female smells very, very, very ripe would be the word. And we have moved to get in the right position for the wind. Because it's important if you park at a place like this that the wind isn't blowing the smell of the very dead animal into our noses. It allows us to sit here for a little bit longer. But that smell will catch on the wind and hyenas and lions will, will find it and they will come looking. Serena, all leopards have different spot patterns. They're all unique, like our fingerprints. Um, and quite a few of the viewers out there actually have all of these spot patterns on record. And some of them are on the belly, some are on the back leg, some are on the shoulder. But what we use quite regularly is on his face. There's a couple spots on the face that are very characteristic in leopards. You can just see it there, but it's not very clear. So I will show you this this front page of my book to give you a very clear understanding of what I'm talking about. This is the front cover of the book. And here you can see these spots over there. There's one, two, and three. And this side, one, two, and sort of like three and a half there. Those are the spot patterns that we normally look for. And then slowly over time, you can start getting differences in these little eyebrow lines over here, over here. And they're all unique to different leopards. And when you spend enough time with them, you can see them. And from a very young age, leopards develop those spot patterns and they stay with them for life. The only thing that changes is the spots become more like rosettes, as we can see on his body there. Rosettes because the black spot actually expands into sort of like a rose. Can you see that? Right in the middle of the screen, you get that sort of black spot with a bit of brownish gold in the middle. That probably early on in its life was one solid black spot, which is now expanded. And the purpose of these spots is for camouflage. Leopards are the stalk and stealth specialist of the bush, and they are very, very difficult to see. I mean, we are only about seven or eight yards away from this leopard, and if Senza just pans right out, have a look at that. It would be very hard to see if you're walking along here, wouldn't it? Torrid Elementary would like to know how long leopards stay with their mums after birth. And normally it's about two years, two and a half years probably at the most. Um, but what we're seeing here in Juma in the Sabi Sands is the males are spending about a year and a half or so with their mother. And then they are kind of moving off. I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that the, ooh, there are some elephants shouting in the background. I don't know if you can hear that. Not sure why they are shouting. It's quite far off. We might see if we can, if, if we can go there maybe a bit later. But um, they will stay with their mother for about a year and a half to two and a half years, really depending on the leopard and the area. The males start eating a lot of food and they compete with mum. Mum has to catch lots and lots of food for a growing male. As most mothers out there would know, young boys eat a lot and young girls also eat a lot, but they seem to stay with their mother for a little bit longer. And then once after two and a half years or so, males will start to move. They'll get pushed away. Big males in the area will see them and they'll chase them and they'll go far, far, far away until they're bigger and strong enough to look after their own area. Whereas the young females will generally stay in the same area as the mother, sort of carving out a small piece of her land to do her sort of life. Okay, so we're going to go from this beautiful leopard and his kudu kill to Taylor with some magnificent kudu of her own. He has had a very big breakfast and he has not managed to lift his head too much for us, but I've asked Senzo to go in onto his foot there. You can see on the pad, you see he's got the toes, so the toe pads in the front, and then in the middle of the picture is that sort of, uh, that bigger pad. It's not too easy to see, but you can see a couple little lobes there. So if now we go to my little tracking book on the front here, these are the tracks of a male leopard or of a leopard. And we can see over here, this is the front toes that I was pointing at before. And now that's the back pad. So very characteristic of cats to have these three lobes at the back. 
and the toes are separated from uh, from the, the back pad, there's a big space in between. And if I go over to a cheetah, cheetah's got the same sort of thing there at the back with those back pads, the three, but there's claws in the track. Oh no, Janet, leopards are nowhere near as fast as cheetah. Cheetah can run up to about 60, 60 odd miles an hour, whereas leopards can probably only get up to about 40. So leopards are not designed, they, they, over a short distance they can run very fast, but the whole objective of the leopard is to stalk very close to the prey animal and then explode onto them and catch them. Whereas the cheetah, they chase them over a long distance, well a relatively long distance, with a lot of speed, a lot of power. And if we look back at the track here, the, the toe marks or the claws here in the cheetah are like running spikes. If any of you are runners back home and you like to sprint on the track, you'll know you, you wear studs or spikes on your shoe to make your feet go a lot faster on the ground. And that helps the cheetah to run much faster than the leopard. But isn't he beautiful? Let's get another look at him. Kayla, we have do have endangered animals. Um, there's quite a number of them actually uh, in Africa. Uh, one of the biggest would be the pangolin. Um, maybe I should show you a picture of a pangolin. Let me see where it is in this book. A uh, rhino are also, I'm sure you know what a rhino looks like. But a pangolin, this is probably one of the most endangered animals at the moment in Africa. It's almost like an armadillo. Isn't that wonderful? And it moves around quite slowly, lots of armor on the body. And they roll up into a tight ball to protect their tummy so that animals can't eat them. Um, I'm sure you've seen what a rhino looks like before. And rhinos are also quite endangered because of very, very silly reasons out in the world. Poaching and the use of the rhino horn is a very long topic to discuss. And there's a few birds as well that are endangered. But even leopards and lions are regarded as threatened in Africa. But here in South Africa, we have very healthy populations of all of them. The pangolin, the population is very low throughout Africa and even into Asia. And that's a very sad, sad story. But a very good question. Because we need to conserve these animals. We need to look after them. Ah, oh, here we go. Hello, Tumba. Come give the little the boys and girls a smile before they go, won't you? <laughs> He's listening. So for the schools that joined us this afternoon, I am super happy that we were able to show you this beautiful leopard and my other friends on, on drive were able to show you some wonderful things. There we go. There he is. He's having a lick. So I must thank you for your input and your comments and thank you so much and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a beautiful morning. And on that note, I'm going to go back over to Scott for an update. Thank you, Taylor. And uh, I would just like to warn any sensitive viewers that Sense and I found something here that might be quite dramatic for some of you out there. So if you're quite sensitive, look away now. But what we have found is that this female kudu was in fact pregnant. And what is hiding just in the bushes there is her fetus. Whether it was born or not born, it is a brand spanking new kudu. The ears are still flat. The eyes, I don't know. But the hooves, I've been looking there with my binoculars, never ever touched the ground. So it never walked. So there's a couple sort of postulations going on in my head is that the kudu was actually giving birth at the time, which allowed Tumba to sneak up on it, or there were some complications in the birth which caused the female to die, and then Tumba found her because the smell of this animal is more than a day, definitely from yesterday or even the night before. But very, very sad that this poor little kudu which seems to be the only thing that the leopard has really been feeding on, apart from a bit of the stomach. There's the stomach. But I wasn't here, so I don't know. I mean, maybe Tumba opened the stomach and found the fetus and then pulled it out. It's very hard to say, being the only entry wound that we can see. There are a couple marks on the, the below the jaw of the female where Tumba potentially might have, sorry, I might have to reposition for that. We might have potentially got the, 
the individual just underneath the throat. But for a leopard of Tumba's size to have pulled down a kudu of this size is just, it's almost beyond belief. So whether he's strong enough to have done so, I feel there might have been some complications because the hoofs of those of the baby there are very, very smooth and untouched. You look at them, they're almost waxy on the tips there, just to the left of the screen. And that is one of the things that's very important to identify um, in South Africa. A lot of farmers have sheep and a lot of them always blame caracal and jackal and even leopard for the death of their sheep. And it's important when you look at a dead animal, a dead baby, to look at its hooves. Was it, if it even spent a moment walking on the ground, there would be marks on the bottom of the hoof, like the scuffing of your shoe, your brand new shoes. There would be marks there which would indicate that it had walked and stepped. But if there's absolutely no marking and it's almost like a beautiful little wax coating, then that animal was most likely stillborn. And in this case, this animal did not step anywhere. It might have been pulled out of the tummy of the, of the, of the kudu. It's very hard to say. We weren't here. But it is an enormous amount of meat still available there. Carla, yes, the circle of life, but it is sad indeed. Uh, this kudu female and her youngster are going to go a long way to feeding this beautiful leopard. But what is also so awesome is we never know. We never know what might have happened here. You never know. There's lots of ideas, lots of stories that could have, could have played out. Um, but marvelous that Herbie and Taylor were able to find this this morning. He is an absolute magician, is he not? And I believe he found it primarily by smell, which is another reason to think that this animal was dead for a day already. The flies are making good work. And what will happen within the next eight to nine hours is there will be maggots writhing within the wound and carcass of that kudu. And that will primarily be the major breaking, breaking down factor in the decomposition of this kudu. And as revolting as it might sound, the leopard will actually feed in there, and so will Ha'ahina. Sorry, Kirst, I, I didn't get that full question. And Paul would like to know something that I don't really have the answer to. He wants to know if there's more nutrients in a newborn versus the adult. Um, I don't know. I think there just might be a difference in flavor and in, in tenderness. But the meat itself is the same. Um, but that is a very good question. I, I think a leopard would be able to consume the entire newborn because the bones would be quite soft. Um, it wouldn't have any too much of a digestive system as yet. It would be a milk tummy. Um, so there wouldn't be much of a rumen or the contents of a rumen. So I don't know if there'd be more nutrients. He'd probably, he'd probably be better off eating the kudu itself because of the gut enzymes and all of the, the, the bacteria within the kudu. Sorry again about the pole there, folks. We do have the roof on in case of rain. But look how beautiful those eyelashes are. We can't get a better visual than that. But with binoculars, I can see that the ears are flat back and Tumba seems to have eaten the entire back. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Taylor. We have uh, zoomed in on these blowflies, banded or regal blowflies. I'm unsure. But what they will do is within a day or two, the corpse will be covered in those maggots. Those maggots will feed extensively on the meat and then they will drop down into the soil themselves to pupate take about four to six days and they come out again as these really interesting looking flies to find yet another dead animal to decompose. Isn't that marvelous? So not only are they eating there, and by eating they will actually vomit onto the meat itself, which will break down the, 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 the saliva and vomit that they throw out actually breaks down what they feed on. And then at the same time they'll mate on the carcass here and then lay eggs and in the next few hours or so, you will see it will be absolutely re-writhing in maggots, which is quite difficult to stomach and to watch. You see flies busy licking its face there. 
Ew, Belinda. Ew. But it is part of nature. It's part of nature. Um, without the vultures and all those other wonderful decomposers, uh, these flies are probably in, more integral than they are. And uh, they form a, you know, a resource out here. Lots of other insects and birds will feed on these flies. Uh, there will be a purpose for the maggots as well. And um, the kudu will not be wasted in any way. You see they're licking their lips, so to speak. But something about vultures, Paul. Uh, there were some vultures as we came in. Um, I'm not sure what they went to. They were sitting... Yes, yes. Paul, the, the, apparently, uh, Tom, who's one of the landowners, was here earlier, and he said as soon as the vultures started arriving, uh, Tamba pulled the carcass under the tree. And there is a, a hooded vulture there, the one on the left. And, but the vultures had found it already. They were already here. But he pulled them underneath the tree to, to keep them from, from the, 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 the regal eyes of these vultures. And the issue is, is that vultures will actually be followed. I've seen lions follow vultures. I've even seen hyena follow them. And they will quite easily help uh, any predator to navigate towards the scene. I mean, we use vultures all the time. But it's not common for vultures to find leopard kills. And Tumba is quite a young male still. So he will learn that uh, he'll probably lose this kill. And so it's important for him to, to stash the animal underneath the tree as soon as possible. And the reason... He hadn't stashed it initially is probably because he didn't actually kill it um, on its own. Or, as I said, potentially complications through birth. It's very hard to say, but very hard for him to tree an animal of this size. The, the, the unborn calf, though, very easy. He is very content in his in his uh, actions today, and he is quite content just relaxing on a very cool afternoon. Very proud of this young boy. It's my first time seeing him. Judy, why doesn't he take the fetus in the tree? I do not know. I um, mean, I think he's overwhelmed by the amount of meat that he has here uh, the fetus is very well concealed but you know I don't know why I mean the tree it's underneath is actually a very very bad tree for him to have done any activity with it's just a shade at the moment there's no way for him to tree the marula tree closest is about 50 yards away that would be the closest and easiest one for him to drag it to but uh, he might at some stage, after feeding some more, drag one or two of them along. But I think he'll really struggle to drag that female kudu along with him. He's got his head up there because some of the vultures took off and flew. And the, they must have made a noise that's perked up his interest. Let's go around that side and see if we can get a nice look at his face. So while we reposition to get a nice look at this beautiful what have we got there hmm? okay so sorry we just spotted something over here on the side of the road of the path here there's a pile of blood there can you get it sense I don't think you can that's probably where all of this took place there's just a pile of blood there it's possibly where he killed the kudu and then dragged it four or five meters into the bush. It's not much to see, but just a pile of sort of gory blood there. But while we reposition to get a look at Tumber and his beautiful ears, let's go over to Taylor and see what she has for you. Yes, he has indeed. His head is up and his beautiful ears that everyone has told me about, which are so characteristic of him with his steel blue eyes. What a beautiful cat. He's just posing for us now. The wind is, 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 is steady, and so there's lots of movement in and around, and so I'm sure he's being a little bit wary of whatever might sort of try and sneak up on him because the smell is, is quite strong, so it's wafting all over the place, and so he would be wise to keep his head up and to keep alert in case something comes in to steal his kill. And uh, 
he would not want to get injured in the process. But he is a magnificent young male. And very, very relaxed. Still a little bit sleepy though. He's done all the hard work. Senzo said that if a hyena comes, he's going to jump off personally and chase it away because he likes this leopard so much. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a sight? <laughs> and he is wearing his fancy white shoes this afternoon, so I'd really try and get that on camera. <laughs> JK, that's an interesting question you ask. Over long periods, does the leopard population remain stable? Well, in general, in the savanna biome or in any ecosystem, the predator and prey relationship sort of is in flux. So as the prey animals increase, predators increase. And then after a serious drought, you'll get a decrease in herbivores and the, the prey or the, the, the predators will increase again. And then if that doesn't sort of rectify itself, then the, the predator animals will also decline again after time. So there's always this sort of like this this graph of the prey animals going up and the predators slowly catching them and then there's a bit of a dip and then there's a dip. So it slowly moves like that. So in a natural system like this, there is a fluctuation, but we do see lots of leopard in the Sabi sands, but then there are lots of prey animals. So I'm sure the fluctuation is very slight, but you'd have to look over a period of about 50 years to really get sort of the, the, the up and down curve of that and then you'd need to know every single animal and we do know them here the Sabi Sands has got quite a good record of their cats so I'm sure if after a period of time I'm sure there's some work out there there's a study done on the fluctuations of leopard dynamics in the Sabi Sands but that's because you've studied it so well but it'll always sort of follow that prey uh, up and down sort of mark. The studies done with voles and foxes and all sorts of things all over the world and they always sort of fluctuate with the prey animals and that is generally the curve of a natural equilibrium and uh, we hope it will stay like that. But we are blessed to spend time with these cats, to spend time watching them, daily lives. We've got a very healthy leopard population at the moment and there are lots of Dekka at Stenbok, uh, lots of Kuru, and impala around so there's plenty of food for the leopards and to continue with that question leopard are probably the most resilient of all the predators so if any of the predators is going to decline uh, the leopard will be the last one to do so because they're able to adapt to all sorts of changes they'll even feed on termites and insects if need be um, and as i've mentioned before in places outside of johannesburg they are leopards, healthy populations of leopards that feed almost primarily off domestic pets. As sad as that might sound, and if you go to India, you have leopards living amongst the people, in and out of the cities. It is phenomenal how they survive. And they are able to adapt around people and to deal with the waste and whatever refuse we might, to, might have left off. And a lot of that has to do with domestic pets and maybe even uh, small domestic animals as well. Very, very resilient. Isn't that a gorgeous face? Hello, sir. Very nice to meet you. It's not your first time, apart from this morning, Sen, seeing him? Yeah. No, you've seen him plenty of times. Saw the first time okay, so when Senzo came for the first... <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. So much going on in that little conversation. I don't know what to really to say. You said all sorts of things that got me rather excited, but we are on our way back towards Tumba. Um, he's just in the thickets up here again. The other vehicles have since left the sighting, and we are going to follow up now and see if we can find him. I'm sure he's going to be in the same place as he was before. Just get back on the track here. Oh, and watch out for big logs. Sorry, Sens, I apologize for that. We have got a roof on, so it makes getting through some of these areas a little bit harder. Not for me, really, but for Sens on the back, 
that gets treated like a, a catapult as each branch gets hit, swings back and connects the poor guy. So I'm having to watch out because we need his eyes. His eyes are very important. I don't know many cameramen out there who don't have use of their eyes. So um, it's important for his career and the occupational health and safety of this vehicle to make sure that I don't injure Senzo, because that would not be very nice, would it? And here we come up to the exact kind of branch that I was thinking about. So let me just go around this way, Sens. This is all for you, buddy. All for you. That was much better. Mina, what an interesting question. She would like to know if a leopard that's born blind or deaf, would it be able to survive? I don't think so, Mina. I mean, I really don't think so. I think their, their sight and their hearing is such an integral part of their survival. It might be able to survive during the cub stage because their mum looks after it. But as soon as it starts, you have to fend for, not fend for itself, but for example, when Tundi stashes her cub in the long grass or in a den site and she comes back, she calls it and it comes to her, but also the cub instinctively, if it hears any other commotion or any other activity coming nearby, will hide and be very quiet. But a cub that is blind and deaf will probably just sit there and call the whole time. And uh, that will attract unwanted attention of something that would want to do harm to that cub. So unfortunately, those deformities, being born blind, or those, what should I say, those handicaps, being born blind or deaf, would not survive, would not survive with the animal, and those genetics would not perpetuate in the population. So the weak, unfortunately, in the, in the wilderness will survive, and the strong will always go forward. So I hope that has answered your question, and let's see if he is still here. We left him just under that bush there, that weeping wattle, African weeping wattle, Good chance he's probably moved around to go and feed. So we'll go have a look. This is not where he was before. Penny, you make the comment that Safari, who was Karula's mother, was blind in one eye. That is probably an injury that she sustained. Uh, oh, there he is. Hello, boy. He is looking right at me. Is that not a beautiful, beautiful cat? I'm sure that that blindness, well, I'm not sure because I don't know. It probably happened through an injury, and she was obviously still able to hear and see with the one eye. I'm sure there was quite a disadvantage to her upbringing or to her ability to do certain things. But leopards are very resilient animals. And I know that there's a, a, lep, a lion in the in Kuhuma pride that has one eye that is blind. I've seen it before. Lions have the, the help of other pride members to do all the work for them or assist. But um, I don't think a leopard with one eye is the most successful. But they are so resilient and such adaptable animals that I think with a handicap like that, she'd probably still be able to do quite well, considering... But from an early age, if she was blind, I, I don't know if that if she was blind from a cub or if it was an injury. There's lots of damage that can be done to these animals' eyes in the risk when they take down uh, prey, such as impala. Uh, warthog are probably one of the most dangerous animals for a leopard to take down because of those tusks. Ooh, i just got a whiff of that kudu behind me. It is smelling very, very ripe. And the flies are annoying Tamba. He is behaving just like Osana did the other day. Unrelenting flies. Thankfully, none of them are landing on us. But his face is covered, probably still in the stench of Kuru. And here he's going to come and do a lovely walk past. I apologize in advance for any part of the vehicle you might see. You can see his beautiful belly. He's walking right behind us, folks. Let's see where he goes. He's probably going to... Oh, he's having a look off into the distance. Something has got his interest. I don't know what. I'm not going to move because he's right behind me. Sorry about the back of the vehicle, folks. We are geared for everything. That is the aerial there that allows us to 
to send our picture all the way across to wherever you might be in the world. Okay, now that he's moved, I'm going to reposition and see where he might be going. He certainly... He, Senza says he's moved the baby. He's moved the fetus. So maybe he's taken it up somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Get that sense? He has treed that fetus in the smallest possible tree around. But if I just go back half an inch, we can maybe try zoom in on those feet. Try zoom in on those feet and see if there's any scratches on them. No, they are completely clean, which means that it was either stillborn or taken from the mother's womb. Very sad. You see that like waxy layer on the hoof? It shows that it did not put any purchase on the ground. How sad. But he's eaten the better part of its, of its backside. But we can come back. Let's see if we can keep up with him. And see where it is that he might have gone to. Don't think he's going to go too far. But while we do that, we're going to go to Scotty Doo, who I think is preparing to head on home. Thanks, Taylor. No, he's not. He moved off about 30, maybe, you know, 35 yards from the tree. Um, and this is something I've seen before with leopards as it starts getting dark, um, especially if they've got a kill on the floor. He's taken that youngster that we saw up into the tree, so that one is secured. But the female kudu is still on the floor, and it's probably very not very far away from uh, hyenas detecting it. And the reason he moves off is that it gives him the opportunity to escape if anything comes lurking, because they'll be attracted to that smell, lions or hyenas, and it means it gives him the opportunity to flee. Um, there's not too many tall trees in and around the area, so he'll need that sort of chance to escape if a group of hyenas comes in. I don't know as a young male what his chances are against a group of hyena or how he would even manage them and what i've seen in the past is that leopards generally get a reputation with hyenas but he's still quite a youngster so whether he's developed one yet or not is hard to say this being my first outing with this beautiful boy time for a bit of grooming you see how his pupils are getting bigger the light is fading. We're going to be going to infrared shortly. But notice how even though he's starting to doze off there, his ears are constantly alert to anything that might be approaching. They need to be aware. They don't have the... See, he's got some intention there. See the ears and the eyes. They don't... There we got the IR. We don't have the... He doesn't have the benefit of, of friends or brothers and sisters around to to spot anything approaching, so he has to be alert. If he gets caught off guard, just a bite from a hyena. Oh, we just had a branch fall in the car. Apologies for that sound. But if he just gets one <laughs> one bite on his leg from a hyena, it could lead to his demise, because a leopard that can't climb a tree is not a safe cat. Can't take his food up. He struggles to hire to to hunt and to get away from predators would be very, very difficult. Look at how those pupils are getting bigger and bigger. He's scanning the darkness. So many sounds and smells that he'll be picking up that we have absolutely no, no understanding of. Lisa, he does have gorgeous eyes. Probably the prettiest leopard eyes I've seen in a sub-adult. Obviously, there's nothing to compare against the eyes of Tundi's little cub. I've never seen anything cuter than that in my life. And he's dozing again. You see, very alert. Always alert. Getting ready for the long life of solitude. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm not sure if I get that name properly. Someone Peanut. Sorry, Kirst, I'm not clearly copying the name. Jacuzzi Peanut. Jacuzzi Peanut is a very interesting name. She, you would like to know, would a leopard or would a hyena go straight for the kill and not the leopard? Most certainly, the hyena would, would find the kill through smell and it would follow it in. We practically found it now coming back, even if I wasn't looking at the sort of two track coming in, we could have found it with our, um, with our noses. And I believe that's how Herbie found it this morning. So hyenas will walk and they'll pick up the scent and they'll keep walking until they walk directly onto the kill. Cause that's where the strongest smell is coming from. And once they get there, cause that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for a leopard. They're not looking to confront a leopard. Um, they will, if they need to, but they'll go straight for the meat because that's what they're after and their noses will take them directly to that. And obviously at that stage, if they do see the leopard, they might try to chase it off or whatever, but if they get to a kill and there's no other predator there, they'll just devour as much as possible. And if they need comrades in arms to help them, they will do their ooh kind of calls to call in their friends. But a hyena that finds a kill like that on the ground will eat as much of it selfishly before calling anybody for the benefit of itself, of course. The wind seems to have died down a bit. It's still a little bit gusty, but not as much as it was earlier. that just like Hasana we're going to go over to Miss McCurdy and we're going to stay here with this beautiful cat and see what she's spotting thank you Taylor he is still flat he is twitching he's very alert it's that time of day when these animals just come alive he's eaten so he's not too bothered Just chilling in the long grass. Be really awesome to have some hyena activity here. And the smell that we have, I doubt it's going to take them too long to to pick up on it. It is swirling. It doesn't matter where we park the vehicle. We get a whiff of this very smelly ripe kudu. It's irresistible to a to a hyena. <laughs> Beth, if you want to know if leopards fall out of trees, I've seen leopards fall out of trees. They didn't mean to fall out. But um, adults are very, very good at balance. Um, if you've ever watched a domestic cat walking along a wall or walking up a tree, they do very, very well. They have no difficulty. But it's the youngsters generally that maybe get a bit boisterous and maybe they lose their footing. I've seen uh, I've seen them fall out of a tree when they're quite young. Uh, Tandy's cub a month ago or so. Uh, we got her jumping around in a small jackalberry, and she then fell down and fell almost on top of mum. It was really quite something to see. So I think, I don't know whether they, dis, they uh, do it on purpose or if it's just a bit of a slip of the foot or a bit of over-eagerness, but I have seen them fall. But when it comes to climbing, there's no better cat of the big cats, that is, than a leopard for going up and down a tree. And it's how they've managed to survive in the savanna ecosystem. The competition from lions and hyenas, it is to dominate the trees, not just for their own safety, but for securing their food. It requires a lot of energy for a leopard to kill. And once they do kill, they need to make sure that they get every morsel out of that animal. And you've all spent time watching, or those of you who have spent time watching Jamie and Brent and Taylor up in the mire with the cheetah, and see how easily they lose their, pr their prey to the likes of hyena and lion and the energy expended by them to catch that is enormous and the more and more they lose the lower their energy gets so it's important that they eat quickly but uh, a leopard doesn't have to do that they have the luxury of killing hoisting and taking their time about it so he's surely secured that uh, that small kudu there but the female is up for grabs for whoever would like to come but in saying that, we had Hukumuri just here, probably about 200 meters from where we are sitting. I had him with, with Seb the other morning. 
He had the remains of Tingana's um, bushbuck kill, not far away from here. So who knows, if Tingana or Hukumuri happen to be in the area, I bet there'll be absolutely no qualms about stealing whatever meat they can from this young cat. David would like to know if a jaguar or a leopard are larger. And I don't know, David. I think they're probably about the same size. If, if all things are even, it's possible that leopards are slightly bigger. But I don't know. But maybe that's something we can check. I have no idea how big jaguars get. But it is a very interesting. I know they de derive from the same background. What's going on there, boy? Thanks, Kirst. Kirsten has done a little Google search and Wikipedia, the source of some interesting information and sometimes not always accurate, but it says that a jaguar is stockier and heavier than a leopard. And that would probably... Jaguar has a shorter tail Okay, he's moving back towards his carcass. I don't know if he sees anything. Sorry again about the pole. He is a beautiful leopard. Nosana is definitely a bit stockier than him. But he is going to be a beautiful, beautiful male. Okay, so we're going to go back around this bush and see what he gets up to. Maybe he's getting a little bit peckish. So that was the IR and back off IR now. What are you up to my boy? Just seeing here in the dark how my their sense. Okay, well while I navigated this bush here with my roof, I'm gonna go over to Miss McCurdy who's also got infrared on and see what she has. Yes, he is. His head is down, and he's lost absolute interest in anything that might be trying to sneak up on him. We're once again in infrared. Make out his features very nicely there. But notice how the ear is constantly twitching in search of whatever might be trying to sneak up on him. He's moved back a good 20 yards or so towards the carcass, but he hasn't investigated it any further. Still a relatively full belly, but he could fill it up much, much more. <laughs> Ravinda, what an interesting question. Do leopards vomit if they eat too much? Um, I've never seen a leopard vomit from the actual food, but I have seen leopards and lions both uh, vomiting hairballs, fur balls when they feed on too much fur, and they'll vomit up a, especially lion, lots of fur and even hooves and bone that they ingest in the absolute frenzy of the kill. But leopards will spend a lot of their time plucking the fur out of the meat before eating, but they still do get major fur balls in their throat or in their stomach, which they will not digest. So you'll often find leopards eating grass, and if you tried that yourself, you took some grass and you ate it, it would cause you to regurgitate. So dogs and cats do it, and it works very well to get that unwanted fiber and cellulose out of the belly. The evening is very, very still. The wind is still there, but it's only a whisper. All of you grass experts out there will be able to tell me what grass that is in front of him, I'm sure. Waving in the wind. A very palatable grass. There's actually two there, but I'm looking at the one that kind of looks like a hand or some fingers. Forage score 10 out of 10. Very valuable grass out here. And it is also good for hiding a cat. Hidden behind is a beautiful cat. 
Senzema and I have been very fortunate this afternoon to spend some time with him. I'm just sad we missed when he hoisted that baby uh, kudu up the tree. I think that would have provided some marvellous footage. Too many grass experts out there, it seems, or are you quickly commenting? No guesses. No guesses on the grass front. We're all too interested in the sleeping cat. It's understandable. It's understandable. Scott Dyson's actually asked me to give him another... Piat says tragus. Um, no, the, the grass we're looking at is not a tragus, but very nice use of a scientific name there. I'm very impressed. Scott Dyson has asked me to recap grasses with him again after my uh, education with him about 10 years ago. So we'll probably do a bushwalk sometime, just the two of us, and go over all these wonderful grasses that we have. <laughs> Barbara, it's not a black and white grass, no? Not at all. Ah, Project Project Alpha. Of course, you get that right. Not only do you get the common name, finger grass, you also know the scientific name. And it's very easy to remember because fingers are digits. So Digitaria is the genus name. And Eriantha is the species name. So there we go. A little bit of trivia for the afternoon. While the leopard sleeps off his belly of kudu. So while we stay here with this beautiful cat and see what else unfolds in the next while, let's go over to Taylor for an update. Look at those ears! Those are the largest ears I've ever seen on a leopard. I think maybe he is growing into his ears. Just like some dogs are born with really big feet, they grow into their feet. I think Tumba is going to grow into his ears. See, we have a couple of vehicles that have joined us in the sighting to come and see this beautiful cat. As you can understand, you would if you could. And he has been lying flat until now, and now he's got his head up again, and his interests are perked. It might be the vehicles approaching that have got his, his interest, but he doesn't, be, he doesn't seem to be too determined on any direction. But he's listening, he's smelling. And he's staring with his beautiful pupils into the darkness. Look at those eyes. Yes, Jessica, he is not only cute, he is gorgeous. He is gorgeous. I'm just going to... I'm just going to assist in this vehicle coming in. because uh, they can't see what we're looking at, because we're looking with infrared at this cat. And it has been a wonderful afternoon with Tumba. He has been such a sport. Just have another vehicle joining us now, so apologies for the extra light. Good evening, folks. As Tumba gives us one more look like to say thank you from us here at Wild Earth Safari Live. Senzo, myself, Taylor and Scott, everyone at FC, it's been wonderful having you on this afternoon with your comments and questions. We'll be live again tomorrow morning, bright and early. We'll see you then. Have a good night.